Samali, yes. Uh, am I audible, sir? Yes, very much audible. Okay. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, very good morning from Sri Lanka. It brings me great pleasure to see all of you as early as 6 a.m. in Sri Lankan time. Please join with me to greet and warmly welcome our distinguished speakers of today's webinar, Professor Adela McMurray from Flinders University, Australia, Senior Professor Sarat Kodituaku from University of Peragini, Sri Lanka, and Associate Professor Heiki Changsar from Auckland University of Technology, New Zealand. Dear professors and the audience, first and foremost, please let me brief you about Sri Lankan research community. It's a voluntary non-profit venture which was established in 2020 by Dr. Manoj Samarathunga, Rajarati University of Sri Lanka. As of now, it has around uh, 120 registered members and over 1,000 Facebook followers. A vast majority of our participants today are from different universities and higher educational institutes in Sri Lanka, including Rajarat University of Sri Lanka, Sabargama University of Sri Lanka, Waimba University of Sri Lanka, University of Colombo, University of Kalania, University of Peradeniya, Bikshi University, Gampaha Vikramarachi University, University of Jaffna, University of Baunia, Uwavelasa University, Open University of Sri Lanka, NSBM Green University, and University of Vocational Technology. The main aim of the Sri Lankan research community is to foster an advanced research culture among the young academics in Sri Lanka and to support them to pursue great heights in their academic career. So far, we have successfully conducted two webinars on publishing in index journals and how to secure an international PhD scholarship. Most of these participants are preparing themselves to apply for a PhD placement in both local and international universities very soon. Therefore, we decided to support their efforts by conducting a webinar on expectations of a PhD supervisor today. So ladies and gentlemen, without taking much time, let me introduce our esteemed speakers of the day. First, we have Associate Professor Heiki Chansal, who is attached to Auckland University of Technology, New Zealand. Her research interests include intergenerational relationships and well-being in tourism, social sustainability and social justice issues in tourism. She is passionate about the more equitable facilitation of socially and meaningful experiences within the context of tourism. She has supervised a large number of PhD students from different parts of the world, including Sri Lanka. Then we have senior professor Sarat Kodituaku. Professor Sarat Kodituaku currently serves as a senior professor, as well as the head of the department, Department of Agricultural Economics and Business Management, Faculty of Agriculture, University of Pera, Denia. He founded the MBA program offered by the Postgraduate Institute of Agriculture in the University of Peradeniam in 1998. At the national level, he has been serving as the president of Institute of Management of Sri Lanka, the premier professional body for Sri Lankan management professionals since 2017, and as a member of board of study of the Sri Lanka Institute of Marketing, the premier professional body for professional marketers in Sri Lanka. Last but not least, we cordially welcome Professor Adela McMurray. Adela is Professor of Management, HRM and Innovation at Flinders University, Australia. She is Honorary Professor at RMIT University, Australia and Adjunct Professor at Swinburne Uni University, Australia. She serves as guest editor on the Journal of Applied Energy the Journal of uh, Cleaner Production, and she is Associate Editor of the Journal of Management History. Professor McMurray has extensive experience researching in public and private sectors and has published over 300 publications. She also chaired the USA Academy of Management's International Team Committee and is a member of various journal editorial advisory boards. Adela's research expertise addresses innovation culture, sustainability, commitment, entrepreneurship, and leadership, including organizational change and development in public and private sectors. Next, let me also welcome the moderator of today's webinar, the founder of Sri Lankan Research Community, Dr. Manoj Samarathunga. 
Dr. Samar Tunga is a senior lecturer attached to the Faculty of Management Studies, Rajarat University of Sri Lanka. He is also the research director of International Center for Interdisciplinary Cultural Heritage and Tourism, Research of China, Sri Lanka. Dr. Samar Tunga serves as an editorial board member of many local and international journals and conducts research methodology workshops for university academics with the National Center for Advanced Studies, Ministry of Education. Dear sir, I cordially invite you to conduct the webinar from now on. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Samali, uh, for your kind introduction. Samali, in fact, covered a great deal of uh, Sri Lanka research community, our aims, our objectives, and what we are looking forward to by contributing to the body of knowledge and thereby to the young academics in Sri Lanka. Uh, thus, I hope we can directly start our long-awaited webinar. And dear Professor Haiki, Professor Adela, and Professor Kodituaku, very good morning from Sri Lanka, and thank you very mm -hmm. much once again for accepting our invitation and joining with us today. First, please let me set some guidelines to follow during this webinar. The duration of this webinar is around 60 minutes from now, and however, if all panelists agree, if they are available and we can have an extended discussion up to 90 minutes. There are four themes to discuss today, including the initial contact building, research proposal development and personal statements, personal and professional qualities, and finally, the publications. We are going to pick each theme and the respected panelists will be invited to talk around three to five minutes on the selected theme. After the first theme, we can move into the second theme. And Respected professors, please feel free to add other related themes, other related points that you see fit to our research community. In the meantime, if the audience has any question, they can use the Zoom chat box to forward the questions, or else they can raise hand, raise their hand at the question and answering session, and we will try to accommodate your questions as much as possible. The audience is also kindly requested to keep their microphones muted unless their questions are spoken to. Dear professors, let's pick the first theme of the day, the contact building with the potential supervisor. I'd like to forward this question to Professor Haiki. When searching for PhD placements, it is palpable that we, the potential PhD candidates preach their potential supervisors through emails. And I'm sure you are getting maybe dozens of emails per month. When reading an email from a potential PhD candidate, what would you like to read in there? And what do you want your potential students to write in their first email to you? Professor Heike. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for the invitation. Good morning. It's very early, I believe, in Sri Lanka. It's actually afternoon now in, in New Zealand. The sun is shining. Uh, so, yeah, I'm really, really thrilled to actually be invited. And, yeah, thank you for a very, very generous um, introduction as well. So to start off, um, I've, I'm currently supervising six students, five PhD students, five are primary, and I've had uh, four completed ones, including one from Sri Lanka. And, yes, you are right. Um, it's a tough competition out there. I do get um, emails quite regularly. Um, so my big advice is really, in, in many ways, I don't, I'm not sure I can exactly answer the questions as, as you sort of pointed them. So, but the big thing is don't send out any general emails. Really do some background research on who you send the email to and really find someone who's suitable in your field. Because as I said, we're all receiving a lot of emails and we notice straight away if it's a general. If it's a general email that's been sent out to just about everyone in our department and I will not reply. Well, I usually reply and say thank you and forward it to on, onto our faculty, but I will not consider it because it's not really a targeted. So really, it's really important to have a targeted email not too long, that's sort of another thing, because we're all tired of emails. Try and condense it. If there's interest, yes, we will follow up and then you can explain more. But if it's a really, really long email, none of us will read it. So that's sort of some big advice. Uh, what we're really looking for is really three things. And that's, first of all, 
you have to stand out the grade average. How good a student are you? And of course, that, that makes sense. It's a PhD. It's the highest degree you can pursue at a university. And it's only really suitable for people who are excellent and have excellent grades. The second one is really the research component. And that's quite often a bit of a problem. Um, so ideally, you have a master's degree with a thesis. So in New Zealand, a thesis, a full thesis is a full year thesis, and that's um, 120 points. Now, you can enter a PhD with a dissertation. So in New Zealand, that's a, a half a thesis. That's a 60 point. But ideally, the higher your research experience, the better, really, you better your chances. So that's sort of the really the research contribution of your degree. And then the third is the English requirements. So I currently still have a student who can't start. He's in Indonesia and just can't make the IELTS. So English requirements, you do need to, and I know um, English is widely spoken in Sri Lanka and you've done your degree probably in English as well. But it's my understanding that you still need to um, sit the IELTS test. And in New Zealand, the English requirements are 6.5 average with writing at seven and no band less than uh, 6.0. So that's really the three things that we're really looking for. So a high grade average, a high research contribution to your degree in that you've actually got the IELTS because otherwise it just can't move forwards. And that's really uh, from me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Heike. It's a very important illustration of uh, building the initial contact with the potential uh, PhD supervisor. And uh, dear Professor Kodithu Aku, sir, you're a veteran PhD supervisor in Sri Lanka and you have completed your PhD in United Kingdom. What advices would you like to pass down to the junior academics in Sri Lanka on the initial contact building with a potential PhD supervisor? Sorry, thank you very much, uh, Manoj, for giving this, uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, yeah, you asked me the advice that I uh, would like to give to young academics in Sri Lanka. My first advice is, uh, if you are interested in your developing academic career, don't do your PhD in Sri Lanka. I mean, that's my first, you know, that's what I always say to my juniors. Look for opportunities to do your PhDs, basically in other countries that are well developed. And uh, <clears throat> if, uh, you are to do your, your PhD here uh, because we are very cautious, like, you know, as uh, supervisors, as well as, you know, administrators who are giving admission to PhD. Because, you know, in Sri Lanka, now PhD, getting a PhD has become a kind of, a, you know, fashion. Like everybody would like to have a qualification to decorate their CVs. And if you look at their CVs and you can see a lot of qualifications, of course, professionals and so on and so forth, but no publications. Now, since uh, the students, uh, basically, we are like, uh, we are like most of these uh, supervisors are also very administrators and they are very busy in their activities and therefore we would like to have independent students like first thing I look at in there is that you know, what is their publication record, at least have they shown some interest in doing research and publishing it, right, and uh, uh, that is the number one that I am look, looking for. Of course, what I agree with all other you know things the professor previous professor said, and uh, basically we do not communicate like in uh, you know emails. Like of course uh, you know there are like uh, very other formal ways of uh, doing it. My my uh, basically I am looking for uh, there are like uh, potential to do research and publish. That's what I'm looking for. You know, if when I look at their CV and if I don't see any publication, even from the undergraduate research, I will be, you know, hesitated to, you know, of, a, you know, uh, admission. Right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor. And uh, since our panelists are from three different countries, uh, there could be different perspectives on the initial contact buildings. Uh, so let me forward the same question to Professor Adela McMurray. Ma'am. What do you want your potential students to write in their first email to you? Thank you, Manoj. Well, um, I agree with what, um, what Heike and Sarath have discussed before me. I'd like to add that um, when I receive an email, I would like to see some research proposal. 
and uh, in the area of interest to that student who wants to pursue a particular area, particularly um, if they're wanting to specifically focus on that area in their PhD. Um, I'm only talking about PhDs at the moment. I'm not talking about masters, just PhDs. I'm looking at um, some research evidence that they understand the literature as it currently impacts on that topic. And um, if the proposal is really out of date, then I do email them back and I say, you know, how did you develop this proposal? I start the communication going and I usually um, uncover that perhaps that proposal was something that was um, coming out of um, master's research prior to that or something that they had thought about they would like to do. So first of all, it's the proposal to provide evidence of writing and understanding of the field itself, of the discipline itself. In addition, I would like to, or I do expect to see a copy of a CV. And from that CV, I get really good insights into what that particular applicant has um, done in the past and the capacity of their existing skills and knowledge and experience that can inform the research experience for PhD journey. I have to tell you that um, since I'm um, being at Flinders, I've had probably about um, 45 inquiries that since end of January and um, 33 people have um, submitted um, expressions of interest to be admitted to Flinders. And so far, um, there have been 14 successful offers. So um, in terms of um, looking at the initial contact, <laughs> I can usually tell if it's just a one, one uh, time inquiry or if it's a general broadcast email. And there are times you know, when I open up the proposal and I see that it's targeted at another university. So I know that that particular contact has actually emailed a number of universities. Mm. And particularly if I see that um, from the CV that that applicant is very competitive, I know that gives me a clue. I use that as the clue <laughs> to know that we have to move very quickly to secure that candidate before the other institution does. So that's a positive out of a negative situation, but it is a very competitive game. And the first thing I would say to particular or you know, prospective applicants is make sure that you, when you send the email, do address it to the right person that you're actually emailing and not the previous person that you email. And also that you check your proposal that it's specific to that institution. So again, um, there are very different ways of accessing PhD and uh, each institution has its own policies and also its own um, processes for admission. So I um, often have um, a lot of people from industry wanting to do their PhDs. So I actually do make sure that they um, write in a research statement the research that they've conducted in their context, which actually helps them with their PhD studies. So again, you need to take each applicant on its individual merit and really very carefully scrutinize the CV to ensure that you're talking on a, um, on a same playing field and ensuring that that candidate has the best uh, possible opportunity of entering a PhD. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Adela. And Adela mentioned a very important thing in this PhD journey, the writing the research proposal and the key elements in it. So when it comes to a PhD research proposal, there are many sections in it. And uh, Professor Adela, uh, which section you read first and to which section you are giving more marks when uh, if you were to evaluate and give marks for these proposals? Well, I really... Um... Provide, I, I actually do, first of all, look at the references to see if they're up to date. And then I know exactly what theoretical background that that particular candidate has developed that uh, proposal within. So if they're looking at it from a qualitative perspective, then there'll be the literature that's, that's being pulled out of the 
the qualitative um, uh, area in that field, in that discipline, and they're looking at a particular key concept from a qualitative perspective, or they might be looking at it from a quantitative perspective. It also tells me what theoretical underpinning that they're looking at. If I don't see anything relating to theory, then I know that they're not including theory. So the references are really important because they create the foundation for the proposal. So um, again, latest thinking 2021, if you're applying for a uh, PhD in the, uh, this year, there are there's a lot of literature around 2021 in each field. And um, also methodology literature is critical to understand the way in which that the research is going to be investigated and conducted and then uh, interpreted. So again, if I'm, I'm a multi-methodologist, so um, I'm kind of uh, fortunate that I can, I have a grasp across both quant and qual, but um, again, you know, if it's a specialist quantitative uh, proposal, then I do know that I need to bring on some, someone who's a high level so a statistician, that can be a good uh, team, um, team supervisor to assist the student in specific focus on stats or, or in a, but multi methodology is where I am sitting. And again, um, it then comes back to the proposal. What, what we're looking for is uh, latest thinking in that proposal. Often you, you receive a proposal that's really out of date and, um, and that's disappointing. But when you look at the CV, you know that you can work with that person. They've got a lot of potential to bring up that uh, proposal so that it will be accepted within the institution. And you know what, um, Major Manoja, also, once you start working with that student on the proposal before they submit it, it gives you a really good insight in terms of one, their commitment to the topic, but two, the, in the ways in which they learn and the ways in which that they um, accept criticism mm. and feedback in developing the proposal so it's at a higher level. Right, perfect. Uh, thank you, Adela. And uh, uh, Professor Koditoaku, sir, now when we are applying for a PhD placement, especially in other countries, it is required that we write uh, personal statements expressing ourselves, our, our capabilities and our strengths. And uh, what is your experience about writing these personal, ex uh, personal statements and securing funds, funds grants and scholarships? to pursue our PhDs in other countries? You mean my experience as a student? Both, sir. Yeah, your experience. Well, I, I don't have uh, experience in you know uh, writing a personal statement. I was fortunate enough to get a scholarship uh, by the Overseas Development Administration. Uh, basically, based on my uh, academic performance in my undergraduate degree, I was you know directly given uh, admission to MBA. Uh, in, St in Sterling University and based on that, you know, after completing it, uh, you know, I was able to secure, uh, you know, my PhD. But uh, I have advised a lot of students uh, in securing PhD opportunities in foreign countries and I have, all, you know, helped them editing their statements and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. You know, as uh, Professor Adela said, like, you know, that is, you know, by looking at, it's like your fingerprint. Like, you know, what I think is like, you know, different students uh, have different capabilities, different strengths and different weaknesses. And uh, so this is, uh, you know, this is the opportunity that you get to tell others who you are, right? What your ambitions, how did you start your uh, journey, academic journey? What were the, the, you know, milestones of your academic career? And uh, uh, what are your achievements, right? And what are your expectations for the future? Like, you know, this is what I usually have seen in my students and they've been, who, has, uh, who have uh, successfully secured you know, admissions. Just to add to the uh, proposal, you know, proposal thing, but, uh, you know, Professor Adela said, I fully agree with her. And uh, in, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I'm looking for whether, you know, to which, you know, as even as writing a proposal is also a journey, like, you know, because uh, this is a, uh, when a student uh, submit a PhD proposal, we consider it as like, uh, like a, pre a preliminary proposal. But we have to work together at least, you know, for a few months, maybe maximum one year to develop the proposal. Like, you know, there I look at whether this person has been able to like uh, justify the research problem. How does he or she argues out? How, what are the, how do they draw research questions? And whether these research questions are connected with their objectives. 
and because most of the people like they tend to like uh, not to you know have this uh, you know idea of uh, justifying a research you know uh, kind of coming up with the point of departure so that looking at uh, the first section you know i'll i'll be able to judge whether this uh, student has uh, you know uh, the ability to do research and then the methodology of course uh, as professor adler said i'm also a qualitative researcher uh, you know if uh, the student uh, is justifying the research method of course again a preliminary thing i will all, always team up with a statistician like you know uh, that's uh, that's how uh, i do it basically uh, i will be looking at whether this person has the capacity and the ability to justify a research problem and to go appropriate you know uh, objectives that's my uh, kind of uh, you know uh, that's how i judge uh, proposal yeah yeah, totally got it, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. And um, uh, Professor Heike, and uh, you're also getting a large number of personal statements along with the research proposals. And what are the key things you are paying attention in a personal statement that you are reading from your potential uh, students? Oh, thank you for the question. I think a, a embarking on a PhD is a big commitment. And what I would like to see really is um, why, why, you know, why would you want to come to New Zealand? It's a long way away from Sri Lanka. And that sort of comes back to um, being really targeted in who you approach, because, yeah, it's a big undertaking. And um, if it's more generic, as, and I completely agree with Professor Adela, um, we know that a lot of PhD students send out their proposals and why they would want to go all around the world. But the big question for me as a supervisor is that why would you be committed to come to New Zealand? Why this university? Because in many ways, where I am at AUT, we can't necessarily compete with some of the really big universities. So when I notice it that it's a generic email, I probably won't necessarily, I will reply and say, yeah, all the best but I won't pursue it any further because it also means a lot of time commitment. So it's a big question. And, and that's um, recently I actually had someone and, and I'm, I'm pretty full up with, with PhD um, supervisions, but this student, it just, it was very, very clear that it's a very good student and a very committed student, but she also could really um, express yourself right, very clearly why she would want to come to New Zealand and why she would want to come to AUT. And that in itself actually made a big, big difference. So I think in many ways, it's almost like a job application. You would want to target it to, um, you know, why, why the supervisor, why this university and why this country as well. So, yeah. Why this supervisor, why this university and why this country? Uh, audience, please keep uh, in mind the <laughs> key criteria that the New Zealand professors are looking at. Thank you, Heike. And uh, we are moving into our third theme, the personal and professional qualities expected, especially the attitude, values, ethics, and behavior. The PhD journeys are unarguably the hardest journeys in life. And a PhD candidate will have to make many sacrifices during his or her studentship period. We all know that. And the stress, lack of socialization, working under pressure, less money, even no money, Right. Sometimes tears are integral parts of the PhD journeys. And Professor Heike, what personal and professional qualities do you expect from your potential PhD candidates? Oh, thank you for the question. I think being upfront, actually being honest, diligence, and of course being really courteous, courteous manner. But I, I think also you know, be honest about who you are. And if you actually have family in your life or you have a child in your life or other commitments, don't try and hide it. It's much better to be upfront and then we can actually work with it because it is, it is an ongoing relationship. It is a personal relationship. And you do get to know your supervisors and your students really well. So I think in many ways, yeah, be, be honest about who you are. Uh, and as Professor Adela said as well, because even if you sort of, Yes, you know, if you grab by a PhD student in their proposal, and yes, I completely agree, do attach it. But again, my advice would be, don't make it overly long. Don't, you know, if you can condense your research proposal onto one page, you know, 500 or 600 words, because none of us want to read um, 3,000 words. 
So in that in itself is actually quite a skill as well to express yourself very clearly. And another thing I actually haven't mentioned before, but it really, you know, it has to be in, in good English. So it probably pays to have it proofread as well. Maybe actually spend some money in that sense if, you know, it, it, it it's, doesn't show very well if there's sort of spelling mistakes and other grammar mistakes um, in the email and then the proposal. So yes, diligence, but also um, honesty and openness. Because we want to have at least, I mean, that's from a New Zealand perspective. We want a, you know, an ongoing uh, and open relationship. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Professor. Thank you. So let's move into the uh, Australian perspectives on professional mm. and uh, personal qualities expected. Uh, Professor Adela, uh, member, all the PhD candidates are young adults and who might have different family and work responsibilities. I'm sure you have ample experience and they are in a different, they could be in different stages of life as well. And so please tell us how a PhD young PhD candidate could balance his uh, or her work and life and work and studies. Thank you, Dr. Manoj. Uh, I'm, I'm very fortunate because I've, uh, got a lot of experience um, with supervising people from very different and diverse um, countries and ethnic communities, so in different cultures. And uh, what I find that's common right across, doesn't matter from what country you are or culture you are from or ethnic background that you have, um, honesty across the board is really important. Um, it's a really important communication process. It's a relationship building of trust and it's trust for both um, supervisor and for um, the um, candidate as well. It doesn't matter how old they are. I mean, my, my oldest PhD graduate was 70 years old and uh, <laughs> he was my oldest one. I've got one at the moment who's 75. Wow. Yeah. And I've had that many, many young ones as well. I mean, I've got well over 80 completions. So um, at the end of the day, it's, it's really about mutual respect and trust and relationship building and honesty to be able to openly talk to one another if, um, if there are any issues. Um, the way I, I do it is that um, I meet with all my candidates for half an hour each week on a certain time. And when they come on board, that is their time and we book that in right through till the end of the year. So they know that that's their space, their time to talk with me and work with me and me with them as well on, the, on their PhD. And even if they can't meet face to face, then we do it online. Um, the expectations are two way. It's really important. I need to be honest with the candidate and the candidate needs to be honest with me. The thing is that um, before we even start the PhD, uh, what, what I do is um, I ask the candidate, you know, just stop. Don't tell me what you're going to do and what you're going to sacrifice for that PhD. That's not how it works. How it works is how this body of work, like, um, you know, like the thesis, how is this body of work going to work for you, you know? What is it going to do for you? And that's a real big shift in mindset. And it, many people feel quite vulnerable in that. And I just say, go home, sleep on it, come back next week when we meet and tell me then. And uh, then once um, they do think about it and they, they say, wow, that was a big learning journey. I didn't think of it that way. It's a big shift in mindset. Then, then I know how to strategize the PhD. I know how to do the research design to help that uh, student through their PhD. My, my whole area is um, in terms of expertise, being able to fast track. So I fast track my PhDs um, through their research process, progress uh, much faster than many other standard PhDs go through. My mm -hmm. fastest one was one year, 11, 11 months. Wow. And uh, he went back to Jordan and uh, he's now um, a professor in Jordan, in a university in Jordan. But I mean, everyone has their own special, unique um, needs and experiences. And unless you can tell me honestly, you know, what you would like and what your expectations are, 
but also along the way, if you've got any problems, if you can honestly open up and tell me that you've got a problem or an issue that you're experiencing or a challenge, then, you know, I can't help. I can only help if the honesty is both ways and that um, the student tells me, oh, look, I'm having this problem at the moment. And I'll say, right, this is um, who can help. If I can't help, then I can put them in touch with who can help. So this is why it's really important that the communication is open both ways and that we have trust in talking with one another. I have to tell you though, my experience with Sri Lankan candidates has been absolutely outstanding. Their work ethic is phenomenal. <laughs> so I really yeah. just sit back and they drive. <laughs> Great. And would you be happy to uh, supervise more PhD candidates from Sri Lanka? Oh, absolutely delighted to. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely you. a dream. <laughs> Wow, thank you very much, Professor. Such a, <laughs> such a great compliment to us, right? <laughs> and, and, uh, and so deservedly so. <laughs> yeah. And at this occasion, we must uh, mention that uh, uh, Dr. Chamindika Virakorn is uh, uh, was a former PhD candidate, student of Professor Adela McMurray, and now who is, uh, who is uh, excelling in uh, the University of Swinburne, right? And she was our uh, guest speaker during the last week on securing a PhD uh, scholarship. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. <laughs> and, yes, Dr. Uh, Chamendika Virakun is um, an outstanding scholar mm. and has a trajectory right up through to professor. I'm very confident of that. She has a wonderful career path ahead of her. She's she an does, outstanding definitely. scholar. She does, definitely, yeah. Uh, so I'm uh, forwarding this question to Professor Korituaku. Sir, now uh, most of the occasions PhD students are given uh, two supervisors, main supervisor and a second supervisor, or main supervisor and a, a supervisor for the methodology part. In the meantime, our candidates are saying, our, st our students are saying, okay, one professor is saying this thing and the other professor might, is saying the other thing. So how can... Uh, PhD candidate balance such a situation when two supervisors are saying or commenting on two contrasting things? Well, you're asking a very difficult question from, uh, from me. Let me first, uh, you know, I'm, I'm also very happy to hear about Chamindika. Actually, he, she was my uh, MBA supervisor and I'm very, you know, I'm delighted to hear about her performance uh, from Dr. Professor Adela. And uh, yeah, now, uh, let me tell you, like, you know, uh, my experience, like, you know, now, uh, when you uh, find a supervisor, uh, and there are two supervisors, because I was in between two supervisors, of course, uh, uh, my uh, PhD supervisor, now, he, he, you know, he has passed away, Professor Michael Scott, uh, and uh, Professor Peter Rosa, he was, uh, you know, in uh, earlier in uh, Sterling, and now, uh, you know, retired from Edinburgh. And uh, Professor Peter Rosa was uh, kind of, you know, he was into qualitative research, whereas uh, Professor uh, Michael Scott was okay with any type of research. And uh, from uh, my background was a quantitative background because I was uh, uh, specialized in agriculture economics uh, because by that time we did not have uh, management in our department. And uh, I had a constant struggle uh, with uh, my second supervisor. He's also very powerful politically because they are very good friends, uh, you know, to like uh, asking me to do uh, an, an anthropological research and, uh, you know, uh, using ethnographic, uh, you know, methodology, which I have no idea and I didn't uh, like it, of course. I don't know why I didn't like it because I, I my quantitative background. Now I have turned into a qualitative person, but, uh, and then, uh, you know, there was this constant struggle, like, you know, in fact, I had heated arguments with my second supervisor as well, because he, he wouldn't let, let me go. And then uh, my, uh, uh, you know, principal supervisor was a really, you know, he was a really good listener. And uh, he was empathetic towards me. In fact, he has taken me to have uh, lunches because I am kind of a little bit, uh, when, when it comes to telling my point of view, I am also like straightforward. And I did not hesitate to tell what I want. And then I had this, uh, uh, you know, constant struggle. And then uh, Professor uh, Michael Scott, uh, you know, he took me to lunch and then Sarath, you know, you have to listen to him as well. And 
things like that. Then I realized, okay, then I had to decide what I had to do. Anyway, so by, uh, you know, by this time I was uh, like, I, I was able to, you know, develop a link, uh, higher education link program with the Sterling University and, uh, you know, the University of Peradenia, because, you know, uh, since I did well in my MBA, you know, the uh, British Council said, okay, now you have done well. And, you know, why don't you initiate this higher education link program? So I initiated it. And what I did was I, uh, you know, got a consultancy opportunity for my second supervisor in Sri Lanka. And uh, it's for two weeks. And during that two weeks, by, while he was, you know, in Sri Lanka, I developed my questionnaire based on a continuity to uh, uh, framework. And uh, I, my uh, first supervisor agreed with me. And uh, then when he was in uh, coming to UK, I, I came, went to Sri Lanka. Telling Tata, bye bye. I'm <laughs> going to do my <laughs> research now and continue to, you know, using uh, a questionnaire. And to be honest with you, uh, I did a pilot study, uh, you know, this is on entrepreneurship uh, in Sri Lanka. And uh, I realized, you know, all this questionnaire, what I've got is not going to make any sense because, you know, people's uh, behavior, their thinking, their attitudes, all these are different. Like, you know, just you can't capture by using a questionnaire because I was looking into process, right? And those days, the only one email account was there <laughs> in our university. I'm talking about 1994. And... Uh, I realized, yes, what this, uh, you know, other person has also been telling is true. And there's no disagreement with Professor Scott, my supervisor, to, for my doing qualitative research. Yeah. And then I, you know, this is a journey, that's what I'm telling you. PhD is a journey, like, you know, you have to discover your own path. Of course, there are ups and downs. And you have to have the, like, uh, uh, you know, ability to manage this. I mean, be honest, as, uh, you know, Professor Adler said, never, you know, uh, backstab. Right. So if you have concerns, tell to their face. Right. And different supervisors have different uh, ways of reacting. Right. Um, this is a partnership. Right. And therefore, you have to, when you are even looking for your supervisor, you have to do your homework. Right. And uh, perhaps you, you, you can look at the track record and talk to pe uh, students who have successfully completed the PhD, not the people who have just dropped out. Don't talk to them. Right. They will tell all the bad things about the supervisor. But, you know, uh, understand whether I can go this journey with the, you know, supervisor. And uh, basically, like, you know, uh, again, to add to what I've been telling, I uh, basically the supervisor's role is to guide you to, you know, discover uh, your path, right? Now, I don't like students coming and asking me what's the topic that I should do, what's the methodology that, that I should uh, adopt, and so on and so forth. And basically, you know, uh, Professor Adela and the other professors, they are very lucky to have really good students from Sri Lanka. And, you know, all the good students leave and do, do their PhDs, whereas we are here to help the helpless. And uh, they are in between, you know, three kind of fronts, like family front, work front, and then, uh, you know, uh, the educational front. You know, they are between these uh, three demanding forces. Basically, what the students tend to do is to like, you know, prioritize their families, prioritize their work, and then academic life, you know, aspect becomes the third priority. So we are, as supervisors, we are struggling with them. Therefore, we would like them to be independent and uh, we, we want them to be knowledge seekers. And, uh, you know, uh, we uh, want them to have the enthusiasm to do research. And, uh, you know, if you have that abilities, I'm sure politics, management of politics is not that difficult. Of course, you know, you have to be, you know, aware of any university in the world, including Sri Lanka, there are kind of political clashes between supervisors. Don't, don't get into the politics of them. And uh, when it comes to, because it's like, it's a strategy, like, you know, I can't tell you, do this, do that. And this is an art rather than a science dealing with politicians. So, but politics, sorry, the <laughs> politicians, the supervisors, of course, they become politicians as well. And, uh, you know, that is, you have to observe, you have to, you have to like uh, talk, be honest, be like uh, open, and then to, you know, complete your journey. I can't give you like hard and fast rules. Sorry about it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing your experience, uh, Professor. That is the most important thing that we don't see in the website. So getting this uh, tacit knowledge, especially. And I like to uh, mention one, one of my experience here as well. Where I had a problem uh, with my supervisor when uh, my both supervisors when establishing my research problem, which is which was floating around 
civic nationalism and the ethnic nationalism plus tourism in Sri Lanka. So in order to convince my uh, supervisors, I happened immediately I happened to publish my initial research idea in a Scopus Index journal. And thereafter, they accepted it and I successfully completed my uh, work. That's yeah. a good strategy, like, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so now we are moving into our fourth theme. Uh, actually, uh, yesterday we, I received uh, many questions from our audience and I'm going to order this now. Uh, the next next big headache among our potential uh, PhD candidates is the publications. Actually, we touched that area a little, but it is one of the main areas in uh, today's webinar. Sometimes our potential PhD candidates are afraid of processing their PhD applications without having a good scientific publication at hand. So Professor Heike, uh, is it mandatory for a potential or junior academic, potential PhD student to have publications in top tier journals? when applying for a PhD placement? Thank you for your question. No, that's not really a standard requirement. It's mm. a nice thing to have, mm. but I would not necessarily expect it. Yeah. I think here, yeah, you know, students nowadays have a lot of pressure. Um, mm. So yes, if you manage to actually publish from your master's degree or undergraduate degree, that's, a you know, of course that would show really, really, good um, research skills, but um, I would not discount someone just because they haven't got a publication already. I think it really goes back to the earlier that you've actually completed a research degree with a big percentage of a research component. I think that's more important and the grades you've got for that one as well. So I wouldn't, you know, any advice for um, people actually wanting to embark on a PhD, you don't necessarily have to stop. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know get something it's also because we know it actually takes it can take quite a long time mm -hmm. nowadays to actually get something published um it's you know first of all submitting it and then the whole reviewing process so that actually can take quite a lot of time as well but it's really those overall research skills that are actually really really important yeah and i really really like what um professor adela said yeah it's and, and of course reiterated but um Professor Saras as well. It's, you know, having that open relationship and being honest. I mean, what I'm actually really looking for as well is that passion. Yeah, if you're only going to do a PhD just to, just to get a degree, um, I think you set yourself up. It's problematic. There has to be, in many ways, you know, why do you want to embark? It's a really, really big uh, commitment. Uh, but if you're really re passionate about the topic and you really want to make a difference, and continue um, studying and continue contributing in the field, that of course gives you a much, much better um, chance in succeeding and of course um, in yeah, securing um, a position as well. Yeah, thank you, Professor, thank you. And uh, let me ask the same question from uh, Professor Adela McMurray as well. Uh, Professor, before accepting a PhD a student to your team, do you consider his or her publications in the history? Hey. <clears throat> I, um, I look at the entire application, the CV as well. If mm. there are publications, I look at the quality of, and there's no research component, then I have a look at industry experience and see what research experience is there and what outputs have been there. Um, generated there. It's all about um, generating outputs. So often um, in industry, there are reports or um, uh, uh, you know, research has been conducted that does generate in, in various types of publications, whether they're industry publications or reports. Um, I do look at that. If, um, for example, they're wanting to actually apply for a PhD, they've got no research component at all in any of the degrees. Um, it's pretty difficult to get into a, a straight research PhD program. Um, at Flinders, they'd have to do a one-year pathway where it's a, it's a six-month um, degree program plus six months of uh, coursework, but you're already starting to work with your supervisor, and that can be quite translational in terms of uh, then ensuring that you do the research design that will then flow from the six month research project to a PhD. 
So there are different ways of looking at this. It's not quite so straightforward. It's quite complex, actually. Um, if I see that a PhD uh, candidate has um, got really good potential and they're wanting to do actually the PhD, they're not wanting to do a master's because at some universities, um, then if they don't have a research component in any of the degrees, they'll only be offered another master's. And then, then um, if they're in a hurry to enrol, then um, I ask them, are they willing to accept the master's, but I could help them trans, um, translate that and upgrade that into a PhD within one year. I have a 100% success rate in doing that. So that's a big trust, trust um, step for a candidate to take in terms of accepting another master's and then working and what we do is we design the research so it becomes a PhD at the master's level. And then we do an upgrade presentation and within that year, we upgrade to a PhD. So, um, so there are different ways of looking at this. In terms of they're not really willing to accept the master's, they feel a bit uncomfortable with that, or they've only got funding for a PhD from their homeland or from another institution. Then um, what I do is I look at their master's and say, right, let's have a look at what did you do in the master's? Is there something that we can quickly generate as a publication out of that? It might be a conference paper. That would be really quick and at the same time simultaneously we submit that uh, paper to a journal as well so that when they're actually applying for a PhD program they can say under review um, two publications under review so there are different ways of going around this and looking at um, publications to expect a, um, a ABDC a rank or a Scopus ranked uh, publication before entering the PhD, they would have had to have had a very different master's experience and, and uh, pathway in terms of uh, what they've done. So outputs are really important, but you know, if the outputs aren't there, then um, often with uh, various institutions, you won't get your foot in the door uh, or you might get foot in the door to a master's, which you could then upgrade, or you could take a little bit more time and work with me to develop a um, a publication out of what's been done previously, whether it's within industry or whether it's in a master's or an honours program. I mean, all my honours students have published out of their honours thesis. My master's students published out of their theses as well, and my PhDs do as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. And uh, I'd like to uh, forward this uh, question to Professor Heike again. And uh, in New Zealand, is it mandatory to uh, publish, to have a publication before pursuing a PhD in an ABDC or top other top ranked uh, journals? Because in some other countries like China, it is mandatory. No, I mean, not at our university. And I don't think it will be at other universities in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, no, it, it's really, uh, the first thing we look at that yeah, actually that the candidate, the potential candidates meeting the entry requirement, and that's the great average, the research component. So at our university, um, if you haven't got at least 60 points research component, you can't actually um, commence a PhD. And we don't actually have that pathway as uh, Professor Adela mentioned. We don't Currently, we don't really do that. We would actually then say, yes, you have to do a master's. So um, it's probably something we need to look at. But yeah, it's because it is so competitive. Um, and we do have a lot of uh, requests for PhDs. Um, we tend, of course, as a, as a supervisor to then actually go for students who already have the, meet the requirements rather than necessarily actually find other pathways. Uh, for them to enter the, you know, into the PhD program. So yes, so my answer is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, no, it wouldn't be. It's a nice have, but yeah, yeah. we're not at that stage yet. Right. Um, yeah. Professor, thank you. Yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, dear Professor Koditoaku, and uh, this question again comes from the audience about the uh, order of the authors in the PhD, uh, sorry, in the in the uh, publications, and most of the most of our PhD uh, students are confused with the order of the authors, whether to whether to mention themselves as the first author or the, whether the supervisor becomes the first or the second or the corresponding. So, what is your experience about it? 
Yeah, the, my experience and the culture in Nava University is that students should be given the first authorship. You know, that's always the case. Mm -hmm. And uh, we never ever, you know, get uh, the first authorship if the students has done the research. And of course, uh, when it comes to other sciences like natural sciences, it might be different because, you know, some of these uh, uh, research are done on funding where they have to have, you know, they, I've, I've seen in my faculty as well, like, you know, people who do research on natural sciences, I have seen the supervisors have become number one, whereas in the social science uh, streams, you know, we basically get uh, even undergrad, postgrad, all students are given the first opportunity. Of course, we do most of the work, but yet, uh, you know, our uh, our duty and the responsibility is to, you know, uh, create, uh, help uh, this, uh, our students create their future. So I think we are kind of uh, playing that role. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. And Professor uh, Adela, is it same in uh, Flinders University? Uh, yes, Dr. Managed, I totally agree with Professor Sarath um, in our institution. Um, it, and most, well, actually, that I know of across Australia, the PhD candidate is the first author. And, you know, there's no, there's no compulsion and there's nothing that's mandatory that um, anyone else needs to be part of that publication. The PhD student can and has the right to, to, to sole publication of their work if they would like to. It's by invitation and actually how much the other authors contribute that they then become co-authors. So, you know, if they're contributing any IP or expertise or writing or whatever, it's around contribution. But um, absolutely, without any question, as Professor Sarav had stated, the PhD candidate is the first author. Thank you, Professor. And uh, Professor Heike, is it the same at uh, Auckland? Uh, yes, absolutely. The student goes first, always goes first. Um, there's no question about that. Now, we also have a supervision agreement. And again, it's about that, mm. you know, expectations and honesty. And that's usually something that's discussed or put down in a um, supervision agreement as well. So generally, um, it is, yeah, student first and uh, first supervisor, then second supervisor, maybe a third supervisor. And the order of that can change. But it's also an expectation that a student probably publishes at least one article uh, by her or himself. So student, the, the, the PhD candidate themselves as well. But again, that's something that should be um, discussed in a supervision agreement as well. What are the expectations around publications? So, right. so there's no, yeah, there's no issues as such then arising from that. Yeah, very much clear, uh, Professor Haiki. And uh, now it is uh, yeah, seven o'clock from Sri Lanka and then we have completed one hour session. Do you have another 15 minutes to stay with us, Professor Haiki? Yeah? Sorry, yes, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Professor Adela, do you have additional 15 minutes? Yes, of course. Oh, great. Uh, Professor Korituaku, how about you, sir? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. More, yeah. I, I can even for 30 minutes, doesn't matter. Uh, right. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you very much. So, uh, they're the main four. Uh, we covered four main themes about the expectations of PhD supervisors. Now, we can open the floor for the audience to raise their questions. So, please raise your hand and I will pick uh, you one by one and then you can uh, unmute yourself and raise the question to the professor that you intend to speak to. Yeah, we have the first question from uh, Dona. Yes, Dona, you may proceed. Yeah, hi all, and sorry for my short name. Anyhow, thanks for the session. And this question is quite a bit of lengthy one. Uh, and I would like to forward to Professor Adela, actually specifically. And uh, when I was researching uh, Australian universities, uh, I research about projects that have been published in a particular university in Australia. And surprisingly, the project had uh, obviously a clear questions to be addressed and the title of course. And uh, I thought to shoot for a project uh, with my proposal. So as I thought my, uh, that as I thought my proposal is in line with the major project, 
uh, but not the, uh, exactly as the same. So if in that case, will my proposal uh, will be an approachable one or should I address the project uh, question? It was surprising that I found some project questions. Was this Don, Donna? Was this for a specific institution that you were wanting to put your hand up as, as a PhD applicant? Uh, yes, they had of it on the internet. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Okay. There are some institutions that do advertise uh, projects, and a lot of the time um, they are also associated with scholarships and very very competitive. So if you're looking at an institution that um, is advertising for a project be aware that you do need to be um, very specific and very focused in what you are actually writing in your proposal for that institution. So it's not only do you need to be um, a, across the latest literature in that field, I would also be looking at um, who is in charge of that project. And I would be looking at their CV and citing their work as well if they're published in that field. Also looking at the fact that um, you're needing to make sure that um, you are incorporating the institution's uh, vision and mission statement into the project as well, in terms of how the research um, that you're proposing to conduct uh, to address that research question is actually addressing the institution's um, research focus and, uh, and what their um, priority areas of research are. I'm not sure if I've answered that question enough. Would you like more detail? Would you like to ask me some more questions? Yeah, I'm not that? hesitant to, uh, I mean, to give the proposal uh, name, the project name. Uh, the project name is how how multinational uh, multinationals operating in emerging economies. Uh, the proposal that I wrote already was uh, how the expatriate. Uh, uh, working in the MNCs uh, uh, and uh, now in world crisis, uh, they're a bit in a trouble. So what I need to find out is a contingency approach for these expats uh, to perform well in global crisis. So that was my uh, proposal and the project is something else, but still it is, related to multinational uh, operating uh, company in emerging economics. So yes. what, what I thought was to shoot my proposal, my, I mean, I was a bit confused at this moment because the project name is something really, not really, the project name is in line with my uh, proposal, but uh, there are specific questions. Well, specifically, name. Yes, you do need to answer those specific questions and particularly in times of discontinuity like COVID-19. COVID-19 is really driving a lot of um, new literature that's coming through as it relates to multinationals. Um, also in the fact that it's also uh, really pushing Industry 5.0 forward. So with multinationals, um, they're, they're a very unique structure and also have unique cultures and subcultures within each of those multinationals. I had a PhD student about five years ago complete his PhD on um, multinationals. His name is Peter Chomley. You might want to have a look at that. That was through RMIT. He uh, looked at knowledge management and innovation as it relates to multinationals across, I think it was about 42 different countries. Have a look at that thesis. That'll give you a bit of an idea of what actually goes on in terms of processes. But when you are looking at developing a proposal, um, you do need to be very specific and look at the, um, the, the, the question that they're answering, very focused, but also put it into context, such as we're now looking at Industry 5.0 and COVID. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. I think I've got it, uh, yeah, kind of. A, Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Donna. And we have okay. a second question coming from uh, Dimut, Dimut Gamage. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my question is, I will go straight to the question. My question is that, uh, have you ever considered uh, upgrading your master students into PhDs before they uh, graduate from their masters? Like I tried to, uh, because I tried to get into, get into some uh, 
PhD programs right after my bachelor's. Uh, but uh, I didn't get any response at all. But uh, when I tried to apply for uh, research-based master programs, I got plenty. So when I in the interview, I asked the professors that uh, do I have a chance to get into a, get into PhD in the middle of my master program uh, without finishing it? In, I mean, in the first year, uh, they said uh, it's possible, but it's really hard. They made sure to let me know that it's really hard. So, uh, Madam and uh, Professor Sarat, uh, what do you guys think about uh, that? Is it possible, or should I be we have to wait until I finish my masters? Thank you. Um, are you asking me, Timuth? Yes, Madam. Yes. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, I thought you were asking the whole panel. Okay. Um, yes, it is, but uh, it depends on. Um, this is what I was referring to in terms of master's upgrade and upgrade into a PhD. But uh, if you've already started a master's, um, you need to find an institution and a supervisor who's got experience in upgrading from master's to PhD. But also in terms of the fact that uh, you need to look very carefully at the research design. The research design will totally inform whether it will be worthy of an upgrade. So there, are two in the, so there are two considerations here for you to think about. One, to find out in your own institution if you can upgrade and if there's a supervisor that's willing to help you upgrade. And two, the research design, whether it's worthy of an upgrade. It's got to be bigger than a master's. So a master's is all about conducting research with integrity, but the, there is no condition for new knowledge for a PhD the criteria is all about new knowledge. Unless you have a new knowledge or a new contribution to the literature, there's no PhD. So that's a really big criteria in um, the research design for a master's that you already have to start designing it in such a way as if you're designing for a PhD and then you can upgrade. So um, find out in your own institution whether there is a possibility of doing that. If not, then transfer to another institution, your master's, and then uh, be able to do that um, in terms of upgrade. But do, uh, that requires a lot of homework for you to do in the first place. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dimut, where do you do your PhD, uh, master's now in Sri Lanka or some other country? No, no, sir. Actually, I got, uh, I'm still at my home uh, waiting for the waiting to go. I got from uh, University of British Columbia and University of Alberta. Yeah, actually, you have to look at their policy, like, you know, different universities have di different policies, uh, you know, when it comes to upgrade. Some, uh, some universities, they need masters, like, you know, without which you can't. Now, whereas where I did my PhD UK, if you have a really good undergraduate degree, you can uh, straight away, like, uh, you know, register for a PhD. Whereas in Sri Lanka, where I work here, uh, the MPA students, of course, if they are doing a, a really good uh, research, then supervisors even, uh, you know, propose them to, like, upgrade it to masters, like. And uh, as uh, Professor Adela said, like, you know, it's kind of a, it, you have to look at the guidelines, the regulations of the university, and then you have to come to an agreement with the supervisor. And, you know, uh, the, as, as she very, you know, correctly said, like, you know, you have to contribution to the knowledge. Yeah. And if you can, like, shape the, your proposal and, you know, you can uh, convince the, you know, supervisory panel that, you know, you are, you know, you can do that. Uh, if the and also if the university policies uh, kind of uh, allow you to do so, I'm sure it is possible. Otherwise, uh, it won't be. Yes. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Dimut. And now we have a question from uh, Rasanjali Kularatna. Uh, yes, Manash, sir. Uh, am I audible, sir? Yeah, very much. Yeah. Uh, so my question is uh, regarding the research topic, uh, sir and madams. Uh, so uh, when we select a particular topic for our PhD, then uh, that that we are interested in, uh, should should that particular topic be interested to the supervisor as well? I mean, like if the if the topic is not interested for the supervisor, then uh, will it be a problem to continue the research, uh, sir and madam? In um, most institutions, policy says that um, the expertise of the supervisor needs to be aligned with the research topic that the PhD student is um, proposing. So it, it is an issue if it's not aligned. So there would have to be a different supervisor appointed. So whatever topic that you are choosing, you need to do a um, internet search and find out who has 
published in that field and who is supervising in that field and what expertise they have in that field because it's an alignment. Yeah, just to add to what uh, you know, she said, uh, basically, like, you know, we have to again look at the expertise of the supervisor. Of course, you will outshine the supervisor in terms of your PhD because, you know, but when, when you do your PhD, you are better than your supervisor, of course, but supervisor should, uh, you know, say if you want to do a, a research on marketing, don't select, uh, you know, a supervisor on, uh, you know, entrepreneurship. Of course, you can do entrepreneurial marketing with, uh, you know, a supervisor who is into entrepreneurship. Uh, as uh, you know, you have to do uh, you know uh, 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 you know really uh, good uh, search about the supervisor and his so her uh, publication track record and so on and so forth. Of course, you know the supervisor if the supervisor is not interested in your topic, and there will be an issue as well. You know there should it's kind of a mutual you know mutually uh, beneficial thing for both the supervisor as well as for the student. Therefore, you have to have the right match. I agree with that, uh, Professor Sarath. And if I can also add um, methodology, um, it's really important. If you, if you want to just do a, um, a statistical or a quantitative um, study, then you need someone who's specifically in that area. Or if you want to do just qualitative, also mm. think about that too. So not just topic, but methodology mm. as well. Yes. You yeah. can add something, and I completely agree. And that's in many ways what I mentioned earlier, that it really needs to be targeted. It really, you know, any potential student needs to do a bit of homework. And really, if you directly contact a potential supervisor, um, you need to know what kind of research they've done in the past, what their research area is. And for example, I'm only qualitative. I, won't, I will not um, accept anyone who does quantitative maybe mixed method, if I then actually have a second supervisor who's got skills in quantitative, but a purely quantitative, I'm not the right person for. And so it's really important to understand where your research area lies, and of course, the person you're contacting. So we actually at um, IUT, we have two ways uh, of actually entering the PhD program. One is, and of course, that's the preferred one, that you contact a PhD, a potential PhD supervisor directly, and that's where it really needs to be um, matching, you know, your research proposal. So that's a targeted approach. And if that PhD, potential PhD supervisor is interested, that's of course already gives you a gateway in many ways into the PhD process potentially. The other one is, and that's um, contacting our faculty person, our PhD or doctoral research person. And what actually happens then, then your PhD proposal along with your CV and all your other credentials are actually being circulated around the faculty or around the school for any potential um, supervisor. But the success rate with that one is probably less than actually having a targeted approach than already having a potential PhD supervisor who's interested in your topic. So yes, um, so I completely agree with what Professor Ceres and Professor Adela said earlier. So yeah, make sure to do your homework. Uh, thank you uh, for your questions and the answers. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Right, uh, I, have a, I have a question received through the chat box personally. Um, yeah, I like to forward this to Haika. Uh, some, some, actually this is about some UK universities, but I, it might relate to the New Zealand uh, uh, universities as well. Are these universities are uh, really looking for the uh, first class holders or the second class upper holders and the GPA values before uh, offering a PhD placement to the candidates? Um, so, um, what exactly is the question? But yeah, I mean, the first thing we actually look at, so whenever I get um, a request, I will need to make sure that that person, that potential PhD student can meet the entry requirements. Hmm. Usually send it back to our person in the doctoral board who will double check because if that person doesn't meet the entry requirements, I will not continue. So yes, uh, hopefully that's sort of answering it. Yeah, entry requirements have to be met. Right. And that might differ from university to university as well, right? Yes, yes. Um, because yeah, I know, for example, at our university, the English requirements, the IELTS, we only really accept IELTS and some others because I actually lost one potential PhD student. She did Duolingo. 
Mm -hmm. uh, she was from Iran, and unfortunately, yeah, our university doesn't accept. So it's yeah, you have to double check. Uh, but yeah, it really pays to go on the websites, mm -hmm. and you know, already then in the email say, yep, I'm making the entry requirements, I'm making the alts, I'm making the you know GPA, um, as well as the research percentage, the research contribution as well. So yeah, so again, quite a bit of homework beforehand. Right, great. So uh, that's all questions we can accommodate at this session. And before summing up, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Chamindika Virakon, uh, a senior lecturer at the Swinburne University to share, because she very recently, she completed her PhD uh, like two years back. And now she is a master's and a PhD supervisor as well. Ma'am, uh, I'm cordially inviting you to share your recent experience, both as a PhD, uh, former PhD candidate and a PhD supervisor. Hello, Manoj. Can you hear me? Yeah, perfectly. Yes. Okay. Right. Um, okay. This. Uh, I'm. I'm very uh, grateful to you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, uh, and um, and I must be the proudest person in a very humble way in the audience today uh, because, uh, uh, Heike, I have deep respect to you. Although I um, get to know you today, um, and Manoj has. Um, passed on very nice remarks on you to me and uh, thank you to you too as well and uh, why I said that I'm the proudest person in the audience in a very humble way is that um, my uh, senior supervisor for my master's thesis is Professor Sar uh, Saratka, senior professor Sarat Koditok from University of Peradeni and then my uh, PhD thesis um, uh, senior supervisor is uh, Professor Adela McMurray and they have played a very very big role in my life uh, to say where I am today so I'm very grateful to two of you uh, and thank you so much for everything that you both have done in my life why I tell them is that uh, I've been very successful. Again, I'm very humble of that achievement. And I want to tell the audience that when you have the right supervisors and you can get to that place. But when Manoj asked this question me, what is your experience as a student um, who completed the PhD very recently? Uh, I completed um, some in 2018. So uh, I fully agree with what you all said, but just one thing that I would like to add here from a student's perspective uh, is actually based on my experience by being in the uh, subconsultative committee at RMIT when Adela was the, uh, uh, the uh, chair of that uh, committee in, um, um, at RMIT at that time. What I noticed was that actually that students tend to compare their supervisors. A lot of the problems, uh, because I, I've been talking to uh, my colleagues and some of the uh, colleagues were uh, coming and sharing their experiences with me because I was the representative. One thing I noticed was that actually they tend to compare supervisors and then that leads to lots of the issues. So I just want to let uh, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, uh, our temporary lecturers and the probation lecturers who are trying to uh, pursue a PhD, please never do this because as everyone mentioned that they have a very targeted focus, otherwise a very specific customized approach when it comes to supervising. So it depends on the student and their expectations and the capacities as they have already emphasized. So never compare your supervisors and that leads to unnecessary problems and the frustrations. So the other thing that I notice is that um, sometimes students think that supervisor has to do like 50% of the work. Uh, it, it's, it's a, I think it's a wrong understanding because uh, I say, oh, she didn't teach, uh, tell me this. Oh, she didn't uh, teach this to me. No, supervisor is there just to guide. And a lot of the uh, problems that my colleagues had uh, actually originated from such kind of perception. So they thought that oh, the supervisor is there to teach me everything. Supervisor is not there to teach you SPS. Super, it, it is you who have, uh, has to explore more and come and bring the um, the things to the agenda. When it comes to uh, my board experience, my, my uh, MBA and also my PhD, and uh, I am coming up with the things and then present it to my supervisor and say, okay, this is what I believe, what are your thoughts? And uh, 
the very at the very first meeting, what Adela mm -hmm. said to me was that Chamindeka, you're the driver and prepare an agenda for the week and come. We will all follow you and tell whether it is correct or which direction you had to be taken. So why I emphasize this point is that otherwise you won't be able to reach your target in the expected outcomes of the PhD. So you're the one who has to do and don't expect your supervisor to do things for you. So you got to explore and again, when you go and talk to your colleagues, uh, one thing very important is that you should not, um, uh, while you are not, while you should not expect that the supervisor has to do these things. And when you are talking to your colleagues, also please make sure that uh, okay that you are uh, talking to very many uh, colleagues and listening to the experiences. But what one thing I did was that I always believe in my supervisors. If I have a, question I first go to them I first explore and go to them I'm I was not uh, listening to all sort of possible other things because some people have different different uh, 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 perceptions and understandings but at the end of the day it's your supervisor who is guiding you and directing you and uh, I, I believe that they are the best people to uh, discuss your concerns and matters so uh, that is something that I would love to uh, add to this uh, discussion as a student, because uh, uh, I noticed a lot of the problems were emanating from uh, such kind of background, actually. So once again, thank you, Manoj, and thank you so much, Professor Adela and uh, Professor Sarat, uh, for accepting my um, uh, invitation um, to participate in this um, webinar. Thank you so much for your wonderful thoughts and Heike, yes, thank you so much to you too. And thank, thank you, you very much, uh, you. Dr. Chamindika. You have been a very active and a supportive member of Sri Lanka research community. And uh, with individuals like you, we can bring greater heights to the Sri Lankan uh, research culture, especially among the junior academics here in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, before winding up, uh, do we have any concluding uh, uh, notes from our uh, distinguished panels, Professor Haiki, uh, Professor Kwaritoku, and Professor Adela? Any last notes? Yeah, uh, from me, I always encourage uh, you academics, young academics, to uh, do your PhDs in you know outside Sri Lanka. Never ever try to settle, you know, uh, doing a PhD here. Uh, had I not done my PhD UK, I would not be in a position to create students like Chamindika, for example. Mm. Uh, because, you know, uh, I, I, I greatly believe that, you know, we should not have inbreeding in this, you know, if you really want to enhance the quality of our education, we have to send them out and get, you know, get them to expose to outside cultures, you know, those communities, build up their networks and come back to Sri Lanka if you really want to contribute. Uh, so. We are losing a lot of good students because we will not have that luxury of having uh, really good students to do PhDs like uh, Professor Hasin and Professor Adela is having. But yet, I mean, we really want uh, our country to move forward. Our, we, I want this country, uh, the uh, academics of our country to do really well. So please uh, use Sri Lanka as the last option. So I'm not letting down my country, but I would like my country to develop. So that's my last uh, you know, uh, remark. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Kodito Aku. And uh, Professor Haiki? Thank you, and I, I, really, I really appreciated what Chamindika had to say. I think she summed it up wonderfully. It is a journey, it's a personal journey, it's about trust, and it's just like any relationships, it's best not to compare. So, uh, and have an open mind. I hope, um, you know, I hope everyone actually got something out of it. Uh, I took a lot. Uh, you know, the very wise words of Professor Adela and uh, Professor Saras. I think um, I learned quite a bit as well. So it's a learning journey. And also what I would like to say, please consider New Zealand. Um, you know, it's, I, I loved, I've been to Sri Lanka, I loved Sri Lanka. And I think in many ways, there are a lot of similarities between Sri Lanka and New Zealand. Um, we're still very much in lockdown here in New Zealand um, and the borders are not open. So we don't know, hopefully next year, something's going to happen. Um, but yeah, do reach out and I wish everyone the very, very best and please embark on this wonderful journey uh, and think about why you want to do it. And I think I really like the words that um, Professor Adela had to say. 
it's not just about the degree. It's something. It's something positive. So it's not just about sacrifice, but really, you know, what does it add to your life? And it's about pursuing a passion. And for that, in many ways, it's also not just finding any supervisor, but finding the right supervisors that actually understand where you're coming from and that have the right expertise. So thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And I wish you all the best. Yeah, uh, thank you, Heike. And Professor Adela? Dr. Manoj, thank you very much. I really, <clears throat> and uh, Dr. Chamindika, thank you so much for the invitation today to be part of, of this very special webinar, but also to get to know you all. Um, my words are to you that this is a very special time in your life, and it's a very big decision in your life, not only affecting you, but also your family and everyone who is dear to you. And so it's, um, it's something that you will always remember in your life. It's a life-changing event. And so even thinking and exploring and embarking on a PhD is very much a part of your life that you will always remember. And it would be a privilege to be part of that. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Adela. And to sum up, uh, uh, there are uh, four uh, main themes that we paid our attention today. The expectations during the first contact building phase. And importantly, our esteemed uh, professor panel mentioned being honest and uh, customizing emails and briefly introducing the research problems during the uh, first email contact. And our second theme was developing the research proposal and the personal statement. It was uh, uh, the much attention is paid towards the methodology and the reference list and the research problem. And thereafter, as Professor Heike mentioned, why you are selecting this particular country and the, why this particular university and why this particular supervisor. And our third theme discussed today was the uh, personal and professional qualities expected, including values, attitude, values, ethics, and behavior, and honesty, integrity, teamwork, trust are some of the key components or qualities that your potential uh, supervisor is looking at you. And importantly, our professors mentioned the different sacrifices you have to make as a PhD candidate. And finally, we discussed about the publications and when you are applying, for a PhD placement, it is not necessary to have, it is not mandatory to have a publication in a top tie journal, but it would be nice. And again, uh, this can be, uh, when you are going to qualify in your PhD, it is not mandatory to have a publication, but this policy might vary from the university to university. So, and uh, so with that note, I like to quote uh, uh, Professor Heike when I was. Uh, 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 conveying her the time, it's going to be 6 a.m. from Sri Lanka. She mentioned, mentioned that it was awfully early and she was prepared to get uh, uh, accept a later time, but I reassured her, no, they're going to be uh, a large audience. And I was actually expecting about 40 participants from different universities in Sri Lanka. And we ended up with 85 participants uh, for these uh, particular webinar and I, I am grateful to our esteemed audience for your patience and actually participation and trying to get something out of that because as you see professors the Sri Lankan research culture especially among the young academics are now changing and we are trying to help them out to pursue uh, better prospects in their academic life and once again I thank uh, professor uh, Heike Shanzal from Auckland University of Technology and professor Adela McMurray from the Flinders University of Australia and Professor Sarat Parituaku from uh, University of Prayer Adenia for accepting our invitation and joining with us. And with that note, I'm concluding and I'm inviting uh, Ms. Samali to propose the word of thanks. Thank you, sir. So, uh, dear Professor, I hope I'm audible to everyone. So, yeah. dear yeah, okay. So, dear professors, sir, madams, and my dear colleagues, now let me propose a word of thanks for this productive webinar. First and foremost, I would like to thank all the eminent speakers who shared their knowledge and experience with us today. 
Dear sir, madam, your guidance and advices are well taken and we look forward to shape up our academic life and career with greater care. I also take this opportunity to thank Dr. Chamindika Virakon, who was our great uh, guest speaker last week for her unreserved, unconditional support for the Sri Lankan research community. And importantly, Senior Professor Khaditwaku and Professor Adela were Dr. Chamindika Virakon's uh, academic supervisors during her MBA and PhD respectively. And Professor Haiki has always been a friend to Sri Lanka and she actively worked on many collaborative research projects with advanced researchers from Sri Lanka. I also thank Dr. Manos Samarathunga, the founder of Sri Lanka Research Community for organizing and moderating this uh, productive webinar. Last but not least, I would like to extend my heartiest gratitude to all the participants who woke up early in the morning, sacrificing their sleep to engage in a productive academic event, which identified as setting a new trend in Sri Lanka. So thank you very much all once again. So now it's time to wind up the Zoom session. Thank you and have a nice day. Thank you, bye. Thank you, professors. Thank you, Thank you so much. much. Bye. Very nice meeting Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Thank you Bye. so much. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.